Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we're talking about uh, Golgi to ER, or retrograde transport, which is the movement of proteins from the Golgi uh, membrane or the Golgi lumen to the ER membrane or the ER lumen. So at the moment we're starting with luminal proteins. So this here is a luminal protein. And we're going to see how we can move this luminal protein uh, from uh, the lumen of the cis Golgi, which it's in at the moment, to the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, now we've discussed that in order to be transported back uh, to the endoplasmic reticulum, it needs to have this specific sequence here, known as the KDAL sequence. Okay, and the reason this sequence is known as the KDAL sequence is because uh, these, this is the sequence of amino acids that you need to have. These are the single letter codes for each of the amino acids. So let's have a little bit of revision of our amino acid structure, uh, well, of our single letter amino acid code and then our amino acid structures. So, right, uh, so um, K firstly, what does K stand for? K stands for lysine. So let's draw out this KDAL sequence. So I don't know if we're going to have enough space on here. Um, we'll have a go. We'll have a go. Uh, so let's start up here. Here's the amino terminus of this um, of this K here, which will be bound to the carboxyl terminus of the amino acid in front of it. So I'll just draw it like that. Then you have the alpha carbon here. Okay, and the alpha carbon has a boring old hydrogen off it. And then it has its R group. So what's the R group for lysine? So K stands for lysine. That's what that single letter is. And you might wonder, well, why does L not stand for lysine? Uh, because L, as we see, we'll see right at the end of this sequence, stands for leucine instead. Okay, so lysine had to be something different. Okay, so they picked the nearest letter. Right, uh, so lysine has a four carbon structure. So one, two, three, four. And then right at the end, what it has is an amino group right at the end, like so. And then of all the carbons to saturate it after this, it just has hydrogen. So let's put all of these hydrogens here. Okay, so this is the R group of the amino acid lysine. It's a four uh, carbon hydrocarbon chain, then with an amino group right at the end, like so. Then what you have is the carboxyl group here, which is then bound to the amino group of the next amino acid along. Okay, so here's the alpha carbon of the next amino acid along. And the next amino acid along is this D, which stands for aspartic acid. Okay, so D is the single letter amino acid, um, sorry, the single letter code for the amino acid, aspartic acid. Okay, now the R group of aspartic acid is that you have these uh, two carbons. Okay, so it's a two carbon carboxylic acid, basically. So off this next carbon, you then have the carboxylic acid group. Now, aspartic acid, when you write aspartic acid, you strictly mean the carboxylic acid group with the proton still attached. If you call this aspartate, what you are uh, referring to is the molecule when it's lost this proton, when it's actually donated its proton. You're referring to the molecule once it's donated its proton which the fancy name for which is the conjugate base of the acid. Uh, so aspartic acid means the acid. Aspartate means the acid once it's donated its proton, i.e. the conjugate base of the acid. And it's called a conjugate base because once it's lost its proton, it's no longer an acid because acids are things which donate protons. Instead, it's a base because bases are things which receive protons. And indeed, it would quite like to receive a proton on this negatively charged oxygen. So indeed, it is a base. And that's why it's known as the conjugate base of the acid, and all acids have conjugate bases. Once they've given up their protons, they go from being an acid molecule to being a base molecule which can receive a proton. Okay, right. Uh, so, um, then what you'll have is the carboxyl group of this aspartic acid residue, uh, which is bound in this peptide link to uh, the amino group of the next one along, which is E, which stands for glutamic acid. Okay, so E, where should I write this? E, um, I'll put it down here. E means glutamic acid. And again, the same thing, there's the same difference between glutamic acid and aspartic acid. 
glutamic acid, uh, sorry, this, the same difference between glutamic acid and glutamate as there is between aspartic acid and aspartate. I, aspartic acid is the actual acid molecule when it's still got its proton attached. And aspartate, um, well, sorry, glutamate, glutamic acid is the molecule when it's still got its proton attached. And glutamate is um, the molecule once it's lost this terminal proton, i.e. the conjugate base. So here's the R group of gluten, glutamic acid. It has these three carbons uh, and then a carboxylic acid group on this third carbon. Okay, then you've got the carboxylic acid group that's in the peptide link. And then our final amino acid in this KDEL sequence is L, which stands for leucine. Okay, so L equals leucine. Okay, and then you have this hydrogen off this alpha carbon, the carboxyl group then going off to the next one, and then let's look at this R group for leucine. Leucine, what you have is you have firstly a methylene group, and then the next carbon has these two methyl groups coming off it, like so, and then a single hydrogen. So that's the structure of the amino acid leucine. So this overall is our KDAL sequence. K here, D here, E here, L here. So if your protein contains this sequence of amino acids, then you will be recognized basically as a protein that needs to move back from the Golgi to the ER. Okay, and this is for luminal proteins. I want to stress that. It's for proteins that aren't in the membrane. There's going to be different uh, recognition processes for proteins that are in the membrane. This is for proteins that are within the lumen of the cis Golgi. Okay, now, what's going to actually recognize this KDAL sequence? Well, there's going to be a protein, which I'll draw here, in the membrane of uh, the cis Golgi. So I'll cover this in blue. Uh, which is known as the KDEL receptor. So it's going to bind to KDEL and uh, it's going to uh, recognize this KDEL sequence and then it's going to recruit the necessary proteins in order to have this um, protein basically moved from the Golgi to the ER. Okay, right, so this protein here is what's known as the KDEL receptor, or it's often just denoted KDEL R for short. So this is the K. Del receptor. Okay, right. Now, once the KDEL receptor has um, activate, well, has um, found a KDEL sequence, uh, then what it's going to start doing is it's going to activate another protein in uh, the membrane of the cis Golgi. Okay, so where shall I draw this? I'll draw it here. So there's another protein in the membrane of the cis Golgi which is going to become activated, well, which is going to be activated by this KDEL receptor once it has bound to this KDEL sequence of this luminal protein. Now, uh, this next protein here is what's known as the ARF GEF. Okay, now uh, this means the ARF guanine nucleotide exchange factor. So this GEF here. This stands for guanine, guanine nucleotide exchange factor. Nucle oh dear, this is getting cramped. Guanine nucleotide exchange factor. Right, so let's give it a color in. And basically what it's going to do is it's going to exchange guanine nucleotides on another protein. So now I shouldn't be colouring it in pink because then it'll be confused for the um, KDEL sequence, which is also in pink. Right, so we'll have it in green, which is going to be confused with the ER membrane, but never mind. Right, sorry, with the cis Golgi membrane. Okay, so this ARF um, GEF protein, this ARF guanine nucleotide exchange factor, this is always in the membrane of the cis Golgi. However, it's usually inactive, basically, so it's usually doing nothing. However, once the KDEL receptor becomes activated because it's bound to a KDEL sequence of some luminal protein, it's going to recruit this ARF guanine nucleotide exchange factor and uh, it's basically going to start activating uh, that, well, it's going to activate that ARF guanine nucleotide exchange factor. Now, what does the ARF guanine nucleotide exchange factor do? Well, basically, it acts on the ARF protein. So we need to talk about what the ARF protein is. So the ARF protein stands for the ADP ribosylation factor. So we'll draw it here. 
Okay, so this is Arf. Now, where should I write its name? I'll write its name over here. Arf, which stands for ADP, adenosine diphosphate ribosylation factor. Now, basically, Arf is a GTPase protein, ADP ribosylation factor. Okay, so it can have two. Um, it can have two types of guanine nucleotide bound to it. It can only either have the guanine uh, guanosine triphosphate nucleotide bound to it, or it can have the guanosine diphosphate bound to it. Now, initially, it has GDP guanosine diphosphate bound to it, and it is then in the inactive state, basically. So it has two states, an off state, where it has guanosine diphosphate bound to it, and when it has GTP replacing the GDP, then it goes into the on state, basically. Okay, right, so this is our uh, G GDP here, so we'll colour this in orange. Okay, now, what's going to happen is uh, oh, well, actually, let me just say a bit more about ARF-GDP. ARF-GDP is usually in the cytoplasm, so when it's got this GDP bound to it, it's inactive, and it's in the cytoplasm of the cell. However, when the ARF-guanine nucleotide exchange factor becomes activated, this green protein over here, what it's going to do is it's going to chop off this GDP, and it's going to bind GTP to it instead. And when GTP binds to ARF, then ARF is going to become active. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.